Well, the USS Monitor, as we know, was the little ship that saved the nation in March 9, 1862. Uh, after that, it serves throughout the Peninsula Campaign. It then goes up to the Washington Navy Yard to be refitted and uh, because you know, a boat, iron boat in the water needs to have its bottom scraped and so forth. Um, it then uh, it changes commanders. So by the time it returns to Hampton Roads in December of 1862, it is now commanded by Commander John Pine Bankhead, uh, who was born in South Carolina. His father was a general during the Mexican War. His cousin is John Bankhead Magruder, but he this Magruder or Bankhead stays loyal to the Union. So when they get to Hampton Roads, they'll actually celebrate Christmas here in Hampton Roads, but then they will receive their orders and to go south because Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, has concocted a plan to capture Wilmington, North Carolina, the great blockade uh, runner's haven. Well, I have to tell you that uh, he plans to use monitors, but the new in there's two inlets really going into Wilmington, old inlet, new inlet, new inlet deepest. But if you have a draft of over 11 feet, you can't go in. And all the new monitors they were building, Passaic class, guess what? 11.8 is their draft. So, you know, not a very good plan. But nevertheless, they don't know, they hadn't figured that out yet. So on Christmas Day, the monitor gets its orders uh, to go south. Um, and it will, uh, actually, the crew is shocked. Uh, one person, uh, well, Samuel Dana Green says, this is not an ocean-going vessel. Uh, I think uh, many of them were very concerned because you had to go around Cape Hatteras, which is noted uh, for danger. So, you know, one sailor on board the Monitor, Jacob Nicholas, will say, writes his father saying, oh my gosh, uh, all the old salts are worried about going around Cape Hatteras, but I think we'll be okay. Well, anyway, so uh, a storm uh, comes through Hampton Roads on 27 and 28 uh, December, which is terrific in its, you know, output of rain and snow and winds. And so, uh, you know, they then realized uh, that it is a, uh, um, a you know, problem. Uh, for, for the storm, they can't leave. And so actually, Monitor and all Monitor-type vessels did not have enough power to be able to take themselves out to sea. And so they have to be towed. And as you see in this picture, the tow ship is right there. Um, that is the Rhode Island, 236 feet long. Uh, it is a paddle wheeler. It's capable of making uh, 10 knots. And uh, it is commanded by one of the greatest rescue at sea persons in the world. And his name is Stephen Decatur Trenchard. And Trenchard has been at sea many times before. Now, I, I have to say, there he is. Uh, and that's uh, Trenchard after the war. Um, he, his father was in the Navy, of course, uh, best friends with Stephen Decatur, et cetera. And, and so Trenchard, actually one of his greatest events was saving the British bark adieu that had run aground on Cape uh, Anne, Massachusetts. And he goes in and saves every crew member despite the dangerous surf and storm. And he does the same thing uh, dealing with the troop ship a Ladysmith uh, and also at the Battle of Taku Forts. He saves a British gunboat. This guy is fearless. He's in command of the Rhode Island. The Rhode Island had been a store ship and then had been changed into being a gunboat. And so they put cannon on board and uh, they reinforced the bow so it could be also a ram. 
and it leaves Charlestown Navy Yard, which is in Boston, uh, down to Hampton Roads. As she comes into Hampton Roads on December 6, 1862, she runs aground for Shoe Shoals, and she gets off the shoals, and they survey the vessel. There was no damage. So Trenchard's ready to assume his duty. Now, I have to tell you, um, there are several other ships in the harbor. Uh, the crew of the Monitor couldn't wait for one Passaic-class Monitor to arrive, and that was, or is, uh, the uh, USS Montauk, because John Worden is in command, and they couldn't wait to see their beloved former captain, who you know, was wounded during the battle. So, but uh, it comes in just as the monitor is going to be ready to leave. Um, actually, on the afternoon of uh, 29 December, the Rhode Island will do two things to prepare for the voyage. Number one, they take the boats from the monitor, you know, ship boats, cutters, launches, and put them on the Rhode Island. Big mistake. Uh, as we'll never now learn. And then they uh, actually put on the tow lines to housers, housers, and they are ready to move. And by 2.30 on the afternoon of December 29, they will pass, they will get underway from Fort Monroe, and by the start of darkness, they will pass Cape Henry, and the weather is beautiful. You see uh, um, assistant, acting assistant paymaster, uh, William Keeler is on board. And, you know, he thought about this trip. They knew it would be dangerous, but it was an opportunity of once more trying our metal against the rebel works, making the little monitor once again a household name. Wow. You know, they, they're ready for this. So, uh, basically, um, they knew that the calm could last forever. And so, basically, the first evening at sea uh, is passed in a very nice way. That's the evening of 29 to 30 December. Uh, they are up in the morning, and the weather seems pleasant. Uh, they, uh, actually, they notice off to the southwest, um, a slight uh, clouds forming and there was a slight increase of wave action which was including you know coming over the deck and washing up and around the um, turret now the trouble is the turret has been packed with oakum the sight holes for the pilot house packed with oakum and this action of this water is going to do what it's going to remove the oakum as it continues. Now, um, they, the, the storm does not really hit them until the late afternoon. Uh, they pass Hatteras Lighthouse at one o'clock that day, and they thought that once they passed that lighthouse, that things would improve. However, the storm slowly but surely increased in its... Uh, um, in its fury, I have to say. Um, and Bankhead uh, noticed that the um, ship was uh, not being towed properly. Uh, he used chalk messages uh, to inform Trenchard that the monitor needed help during the evening. He would put up a red lantern. However, even though it was towed badly, yawning very much, and with the increased motion, uh, they were going to have to do something about it, and they actually stop at 9 p.m., and they adjust the lines to the Rhode Island. This is a major thing. You know, I, you can't believe it, but while this storm is starting to build in ferocity, guess what? They're, the officers of the Monitor are having dinner, you know, drinking wine and what have you, without a worry uh, but the storm. They think everything's nice. Because even though the Oakland's been passed, water's coming down through the ring, the connection with the, the, uh, the turret, uh, the bilge pumps, they work perfectly. There's no water staying in the monitor. Everybody is happy. 
However, Trenchard, after having the tow lines adjusted, he noticed how the monitor would lie in a trough of the sea and making a complete breach over it. In other words, the waves are going over the turret of the monitor. And so he uh, thinks uh, there may be some action that he has to take. So basically, it's monitor is going to be hit by a series of very uh, strong squalls. Uh, the ship goes up on a wave and then will come down and actually you go in the monitor center. You can see how the hull was affixed to the uh, armored deck and it's just a row of two bolts going around and that armored deck overhanged the uh, hull. And so right where that stuff joins, it's starting to come apart. In fact, one person says, this ship may fall apart before it sinks. So this is not um, a happy day for anyone. Um, so basically, uh, by 1030, um, the second, ass second assistant um, engineer, Joseph Waters, tells Bankhead that he could only, he, the water had risen quickly so much in the engine room that he could only run the pumps and for only so much longer because the fires were being extinguished. So there's a problem. So Bankhead, you know, finally gets the attention of the Rhode Island and he shouts, um, send boats immediately. We are sinking. Now this goes from nine o'clock. We're okay. And by 11 o'clock, we are not, we are in danger. And so Bankhead really recognizes a, a huge problem, and that is the more powerful Rhode Island is pulling the monitor into the waves, right? And so this is causing more and more water. So Bankhead decides that he's going to chop the tow lines, and he sends quarter gunner James Fenwick to do it, but he's swept overboard by the sea. Boson's mate, John Stocking, took an axe, frantically tried to chop at the lines. However, he is also swept away. And acting master Lewis Stoddard will act, and this, this rope is 13 inches wide, so, you know, and there are two of them. So you can just figure this is pretty serious hacking and you know there's stanchions that go around the deck of the monitor so you have to hook your arm in that stanchion and hit with the axe just as the waves are coming over and you're number three you know <laughs> doing it and you've seen the other ones switch off so trenchard wasted no time for the rescue operation he called all hands to clear away two boats. He then asked for volunteers to manage both rescue craft and more volunteered than were needed. The Rhode Island back towards the monitor. One of the tow lines that had been chopped fouls the uh, side wheel and uh, the port side wheel or paddle wheel, depends on what you want to call it. And the uh, Rhode Island starts to lose control. Okay, so these two, the launch is commanded by um, acting master's mate, D. Rodney Brown, and the cutter is going to be commanded by acting ensign, Albert Taylor. Now, they call them acting because the regular Navy, right, uh, exists. However, they needed so many more naval personnel that you were temporary, uh, so you were acting. Um, so the rescue boats all of a sudden get close to the Rhode Island. And, and just remember, you got anywhere from 15 to 30 foot waves. It's sleet. They chart 30 knot winds at times, gusts. And you are in a rowboat, right? A pretty big rowboat, but uh, you're still in a rowboat. And like Brown's rowboat, has himself and seven other men. So this is uh, really uh, uh, kind of, uh, so you can see where they have to come down, this Cape Hatteras, um, and this is the danger zone of, well, that's why it's called the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Uh, here you go. Uh, this is what's happening. Trenchard's firing off 
Colson lights, as they're called, uh, flares, basically, to light up the scene. There you can see men on the uh, uh, on top of the turret, and then men on the deck here. Now, this is probably the second trip back uh, to the Rhode Island, because the first trip, both longboats get alongside, and the believe it or not, the Rhode Island uh, will come very close to the monitor. This is like danger because, as Trenchard will relate, that one false move, one bad wave, and the monitor could ram the Rhode Island and we'd all be lost. And so uh, he's only there for a moment, but he throws uh, what are called blights or ropes with hoops, right? And so that you get in there and they'll haul you up over the ship. Now, you know, the, the Rhode Island, as you can tell, towers over the monitor. And so no one wanted to do that. So that instead, they would get in the longboats. But while the Rhode Island's there, it almost bumps the monitor. And instead, it crushes one of the longboats. It's the longboat that's commanded by Albert Taylor, acting Ensign Albert Taylor. And I have to tell you, um, it, was, uh, it was so badly damaged. Uh, nevertheless, they got as many monitors, as they would call them, on board. And then they headed back. Uh, actually, one acting master's mate, um, Joseph Stevens, took one of the oars and tried to lean on the side of the boat out to help guide because you got to jump from here to there about to be safe. And you're in a rocking sea, so imagine the danger. So Stevens bravely puts that oar out. However, he leans too far over the crushed gunnel, and guess what? He falls overboard, but he gets saved. Oh my gosh, when that boat gets back, um, it will be amazing. Um, and uh, I have to tell you, uh, J William Keeler, as we talk about, our damages were not yet over. We were in, now he got on the deck, a wave throws him into the ocean, another wave throws him back on the deck, then he jumps into the boat, and he jumps into the boat that uh, uh, we were in a leaking, overloaded boat, through whose crust sides the water was rushing in streams and nearly a half mile to row over the storm-tossed sea before we could reach the Rhode Island. I tell you, everyone's being brave at this moment. Now, when uh, Taylor's boat gets to the Rhode Island, they, of course, pull everyone up. Now, it just so happens that... Uh, um, they decide that we're not going to use that boat again. But one, Coxman, I mean, uh, David T. Compton was still in the crushed boat, and he says, look, I'm going back, you know, and I'm going to use my oar to scull the boat. I don't need you guys, you know, and he's ordered, don't do that, because that boat was sinking, and so uh, that would have been very bad. So Rodney Brown, of course, will re take his launch back again to the monitor. As we know, he gathers as many people, um, and uh, basically, uh, Bankhead pleaded with several uh, people, uh, it is, I, I like that, but, uh, you know, uh, there's several people still on the turret. And you can see that's Rodney Brown's boat. That's the uh, second trip back. Um, and you can see, once again, that's Rodney Brown's boat. Um, the other crush boat is right, whoops, is right alongside the uh, Rhode Island there. And uh, so you can see just how terrible the seas are how risky this rescue operation is going to be. There's the Rhode Island. There's, of course, our hero, Stephen Decatur Trenchard. Uh, and wait a second, don't want to go there yet. So basically, um, as they move away, Rodney Brown's boat moves away, um, they see these forms up on the ship, and Bankhead says, 
pleased with them to come. Actually, uh, Rodney Brown will merely say, I will be back for you. So he goes back to the Rhode Island, um, and uh, and it actually the when it got alongside the Rhode Island, a huge wave came up. Grenville Weeks, the uh, acting assistant surgeon on board the Monitor, puts his hand out to try and stop the uh, launch from hitting the side. And I just want to tell you, um, the Rhode Island is iron hulled, so you know wood and iron doesn't work well together in the Civil War. And so what's going to happen is, is that uh, uh, he will dislocate his arm, crushes three fingers, uh, he loses the, but he says, an arm is good to lose instead of a life. And so he's very true. Now, Rodney Brown is going to go back again uh, to the uh, uh, monitor and they're getting close, but the, the winds are so hard, they're having difficulty getting to it. And so as a result of that, um, they are uh, very slow. So um, some people say 1230, some people say 1, some people say 130. The monitor, and Rodney Brown's being guided by this light. And so actually a big swell comes, and when he comes down, the monitor has disappeared. He goes where he sees a big eddy, like where a ship would have been, and uh, he waits there in case someone pops up that he can rescue. As he does that, guess what? Rhode Island, because of the storm, is moving farther and farther away. They're now about four miles away, and Brown, for a little while, sees their lights, and then they're gone. Oh my gosh, this is terrible because uh, you know they're out in the danger zone themselves, which means that uh, uh, what are they going to do? Well, Brown realizes that he has to keep to the shipping lanes if he has any chance of being rescued. So he takes down the mast, ropes it, uses it as a drag so they can kind of control where their boat is moving. So, and then they're rowing, I gotta tell you. So they have been rowing since 1030. And so they are still rowing when dawn comes. And so, um, because there was this Northeast current that was, as you know, two major uh, currents come together at Cape Hatteras. And so that makes the sea rough and uh, dangerous. So um, at dawn, they look around and their prospects seem very dim. They see a steamer off in the distance and that steamer, you know, they try to wave and do everything, passes them right by. Then a Brown says he saw a small boat, perhaps a half mile away with one, two or three men in it. And the waves are going up and down. And on the third time, that boat disappears. Well, now another sailboat, a schooner, will come by. And Rodney Brown, of course, has Colson flares. He fires them off, uh, tries to be noticed by the uh, schooner that passes by. He can actually see people on the deck. That's how close it comes. But it ignores all of Brown's signals. Brown realizes, oh my gosh, this is not very good. And uh, so what he does is he, using the oars, he hoists up and the, he brings the uh, mast back in the boat and he will rig a sail, taking the coats from all of his fellow uh, seamen on the boat. So, you know, these guys, I have to tell you, are cold. They are chilled to the bone, wet. They had not eaten or had water since they left the Rhode Island. That's at 1030. Okay, so you can only go so long without, you know, glasses of water and so forth. Well, now that I'm thinking about it. So, uh, they, they, nevertheless, Brown urges them on. We must make the extra exertions to be able to find refuge. 
Well, finally, a schooner comes by and they do see this blue mass that has been created. And you could see the type of coat they would have been wearing in the Monitor Center. Uh, and I don't think they make a very good sale, but nevertheless, they were desperate. So um, the schooner that saw them at 11 a.m. was the A. Colby of Bucksport, Maine, bound for Fernanda, Florida, with a load of bricks for the U.S. Army. So this is all nice. It's commanded by H.D. Harriman, and he will pick up the survivors and their boat, no less, and we'll say, and Brown says, well, can you please take us to Beaufort, North Carolina? This is totally out of his way. And he says, of course I will. Um, and so I have to tell you, um, they will, he'll change his course. And because he's not familiar with the port of Beaufort, he will run aground on Diamond Shoals. Wow, well, Brown and his crew get back in boats to try and pull the, and remember, I just got, I've been in a boat by this time, almost, what, 12, 16 hours, and I'm getting back in the boat, trying to save the boat that saved me. And so, so they pull it off, and they get back on the boat, and they sail to Hatteras Inlet. This is the evening of December 31st. The Harriman's uh, boat is leaking very badly. They have to have a bucket line. They're manning the pumps. I mean, this is tragic. And so when they arrive off Hatteras Inlet, what happens? Rodney Brown and his boys get back in a boat and they go into the inlet and they find the guard ship, the USS Miami. And the Miami was purpose built. Uh, it's called a double ender. And so the paddle wheel, pretty powerful engines, could make eight knots. And so, uh, so Brown will go and uh, talk with acting Lieutenant Robert Townsend. He says, you've got to take this ship. It's going to sink unless you take it to Beaufort. And we're from the Rhode Island, and we don't know where the Rhode Island is. We know where the monitor is, is at the bottom of the ocean, and take us to Beaufort. So, huh, what do they do? They the Miami tows the uh, Harriman uh, to, uh, not the Harriman, the A. Colby, uh, to Bogue Sound, and Brown gets back in the boat, goes and sees um, the highest ranking officer at the Beaufort station, a man known as Percival Drayden. Now, I got to tell you, Drayden was commander of the USS Passaic and was towed by the state of Georgia the same time that uh, the monitor was being towed by the Rhode Island. And they last saw the Passaic in the state of Georgia around nine o'clock on the evening of December 30th. So he goes, sees Drayden, uh, and uh, he tells the story that what happened to the monitor, and Drayden tells him, well, it almost happened to us. These monitors really are not seaworthy. <laughs> and so, uh, what? and Drayden survived his ship because he threw off all the cannon, much of the coal, because you know he needed to get as much, make that ship as buoyant as possible. So Brown says, well, you know, here's the ship that saved us and it's sinking and I want you to give me 12 more men and we're going to go on there and we're going to offload the bricks so we can put this thing uh, in a yard for repairs. And Drain says, go for it. And so for the next several days, uh, they're there. Um, you know, they arrived in Beaufort on 2 January, um, and they helped keep that ship afloat. On 8 January, uh, believe it or not, Brown and his men are transferred to the store ship William Badger. And he's going to say this often, that that crew uh, gave us every degree of kindness and intention. 
but then two days later the Rhode Island return or comes to Beaufort and so they'll be rejoiced they want to get back on their ship and uh, so um, I have to tell you that when he gets on the Rhode Island he tells Trenchard uh, that I cannot say too much in praise of Captain Harriman who did all that could be done and thought little of the trouble which he necessarily put him by. So altering his original course, voyage, and although all he possessed was in the schooner, yet he told me when she struck, in other words, ran aground, that he would willing lose all to save anyone, and that if he should lose his vessel and cargo, he would never regret taking us on board. I mean... This is this 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 is a tale of bravery. I have to tell you beyond all compare. Well, so uh, we're going to see several individuals will receive medal of honors for their service. This is Luke Griswold, who's an ordinary seaman, um, and uh, the the seven that receive medal of honors will be Lewis Griswold, seaman Lewis A. Horton. Landsman John Jones, who was captain of the Afterguard, Hugh Logan, seaman, uh, George Moore, seaman, Coxman Charles H. Smith, and Coxman Maurice Wagg. And most of their Medal of Honors read, on board of the USS Rhode Island, On board of the USS Rhode Island, which was engaged in saving the lives of the officers and men and crew of the Monitor, 30 December 1862, participating in the hazard, hazardous rescue of the officers and crew of the sinking Monitor, Logan, after rescuing several of the men, became separated in a heavy gale with other members of the cutter that had set out from the Rhode Island and spent many hours in the small boat at the mercy of the weather, high seas, until finally picked up by the, a schooner 50 miles east of Hatteras. And I've got to tell you, when the monitor sank, it was approximately 17 miles from Cape Hatteras. So you can see that small boat in that heavy storm. Look how far it was pushed. Look why he had to make the sail uh, or the mass into a drag, try and keep himself in that shipping lanes. And so by doing so, he actually saw four ships, two of which probably saw him and didn't stop, and then the Harriman did stop at great risk to themselves. So uh, actually, Maurice Wagg uh, citation was slightly different uh, than others, uh, and there he is. <laughs> I got to tell you, this guy, uh, you know, uh, of course, his his gonna simply says participating in the hazardous task of rescuing the officers and men of the sinking monitor. Wag distinguished himself by meritorious conduct during this operation. Wow! All right now, I got to tell you, you know, when all is said and done, um, even though master acting master's mate D. Rodney Brown participated in the rescue of the monitor's crew, helped guide his cutter to safety once it is separated from Rhode Island, and once rescued, helped to save the A. Colby from sinking. He was not awarded a Medal of Honor and rejected all accolades, stating to Commander Trenchard, I was only doing my duty, sir. Wow. Now that is heroism beyond all compare. And so uh, these men, uh, you know, the story is often overlooked, and you can track many of them after their career. I think uh, Wag uh, lives until uh, early 1880s. Um, he, when he dies, his wife then applies for a pension, and the pension office says, "Well, uh, you know, his wife's already picked it up because he was already he was married and left her behind." And so, oh my gosh. Uh, the most telling story is that of Hugh Logan. Hugh Logan stays on board of the Rhode Island and in gunnery practice in March of 1863, he, there will be an accident 
miss shell, miss fires, and taking with it the shell into the water, um, Seaman Hogan. Now, I got to tell you, Logan, excuse me, is a dangerous, and you know, he's picked up, his arms are mangled, uh, he'll have them amputated at the shoulder. Now, he's a customs clerk, and so he wants to go back to work. And so he learns to write with a pen in his mouth. And when you look at his writings, it's better than most people's today. And that was the spirit of those people on board the Rhode Island, led by Stephen Decatur Trenchard and guided by Rodney Brown, who saw it just his duty, nothing more than what he did from December 30th, all the way through January 2nd. It's, it's a tale that should be told over and over again. Anyway, any questions? Uh-oh. Now I'll get in trouble. <laughs> okay. Stephanie, you start online, if you will. Okay. Kurt X, was Monica under her own power or was she a dead toll during the voyage? Well, during the voyage, yes, she was running under her own power. However, the uh, Rhode Island was stronger. And so it was not really, it should have turned off its engine. But if it turned off its engine, most of the systems would not work. So they kind of had to do that. And then the fire will be extinguished to the extent that waters can only maintain steam enough to keep the pumps going. And that is the most important thing. When the engine stops, they cut the tow lines, actually Bankhead will drop an anchor. And when he drops his anchor, uh, actually blows out the packing in the anchor well and so more water comes in. This ship is leaking from its hull uh, from the turret, uh, from uh, you know, every hawse hole, everywhere, uh, the pilot house. I mean, a grade in his right, do not go to sea in that vessel. <laughs> and so, uh, but it was a great vessel, the monitor for what it did on March 9th. Um, so, what else would you like to know? Oh. I'm going to give the mic to Frank here, and then we'll come back to you, Steph. Uh, you showed us the pictures of Trenchard. Yes. You had two of them. So you had the, the second one where he's really gray and everything. Yes. And then the first one you showed us, that was 1870, it says. Uh -huh. Then when you go back to the first one you had, mm -hmm. I think it said 1872, and he was not a bit gray in it. Uh, well, actually, um, if, you you notice, <laughs> if you notice, if you notice... Uh, this is when he's a rear admiral. Yeah, I think that said he was too. Uh, well, yeah. yes, and, uh, but this yeah. is later. I think that's the wrong date. Think it's the wrong date, probably. Okay. Yeah, and, and he notice he's got a medal from Great yeah. Britain. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, and actually has to go to Congress and say, "Can I get this medal?" Yeah. They say yes. When he gets a gold sword from Victoria, right? This is not mm. not, not a slouchy thing. He has to at remember we're not supposed to receive gifts from foreign potentates. Yes. And so he had to go to Congress. Congress says, yes, you can have it. And so, I mean, to walk in a room when you're trenchered and you have this sword you're wearing, everybody knows yeah. what like you are. They... Oh, yeah, yeah, just <laughs> like that. Uh, and so this is probably, now I got to tell you, while he's a rear admiral, he's uh, a commander of the, uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard for a while. And so he's at the dock and he sees a uh, ferry that's going to run into the dock. And so what does Trencher do? He tries to stop the ferry from doing so and he falls overboard. I'm going to tell you one thing about uh, good old Trencher. He cannot swim. <laughs> so he has to be saved by a seaman who receives the Medal of Honor for saving the great rescue at sea individual. Oh it's it's amazing, you know. <laughs> so, what else would you like Stephanie, to Stephanie, give us another oh. online question. Okay. Did all of the gallant seamen who... Oh, I'll type that. 
Okay. Did all of the gallant seamen who became recipients of the Medal of Honor for risking their lives in the rescue attempt have a memorial dedicated to their valor? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, in, in researching all the crew members and everything, they die in different places. Uh, this, this story is not, you know, most of the time, you tell the story of the sinking of the monitor and you stop when it sinks, you know? I mean, I wrote a book about the monitor and I stopped when it sank. Mm -hmm. And I, I was curious enough, uh, you know, sometimes I have nothing better to do than research stuff. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I cast a light upon, I think I wrote a blog and gave a lecture on African-American Medal of Honor recipients. You did. And when I was doing that, I came across, I think it was WAGS was the first one I saw. And I went, oh, my goodness, what else, you know? And then I found all the others. Then I found um, in the official records some letters written by Rodney Brown himself and other people writing about Rodney Brown. Yeah. My goodness. It, it, it just, I knew I, I wanted to share this story because it is so related to the monitor, but the saving of those 47 people mm. from the monitor was done with great risk by all the seamen in those boats, the cutter and the launch. Mm. And to survive in a small launch at sea during a storm, isolated, is an amazing feat. And it was all done thanks to the leadership of Rodney Brown. A question from in, in, in the room. Yes, sir. Whatever happened to the seaman? It, put it up close to you. Okay. Whatever happened to the seaman that wrote the letter to his dad and said, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Oh, Jacob Nicholas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. He's one of the greatest stories going. Uh, he had just joined the Monitor's crew in November uh, because Monitor, many of the Monitor boys had deserted once they got to Washington Navy Yard. You know, surviving in that ship, you know, wow, I've had enough. One got so drunk that uh, this is Wilhelm Durst. He got so drunk one night, he's deserted, and he's got a big tattoo, WD, on his forearm, right? And so... He gets drunk and a press crew, as you would call it, picks him up and enlists him in the Navy, right, on board the receiving ship USS North Carolina in Brooklyn Navy Yard. And lo and behold, he gets a new name called Walter David. <laughs> and they, there's much more to that story. Um, I have to say, uh, Jacob Nicholas perishes during this. We don't know whether he's one that swept off the deck. He could be, and there's a good chance that he's one of the few that stay on the monitor because when we found two bodies and of course uh, he's like one of two people for this one body and so but we can't take it any further. But I have to tell you that his his, his Sister writes, you know, to Bankhead. Bankhead is sick and uh, is unable to do anything. And so that duty to reply goes to um, Dr. Grenville Weeks. And Weeks writes that, uh, I am too unwell to do anything but to dictate this brief note. Your brother did his duty well, and he's gone to a better place where storms do not come. Wow. Okay. Apollo. Anything else? Stephanie? Yes. Ah. What did the Rhode Island do for the rest of the war? Oh, well, it was a gunboat. And so it um, captured, uh, I think it's four blockade runners. Uh, it was supposed to try and chase down the CSS Sumter, but it didn't do that, you know. And uh, so it was a blockader. Um, and re, you know, when you captured a blockade runner, let me just tell you, it gets adjudicated, right? And so they value the blockade runner at, let's say, five dollars, the cargo, all that cotton or what have you, ten dollars. 
So all the crew of the ship that captured it get to split that. It's called prize money. So you were very motivated <laughs> to capture those blockade runners. Uh, Bankhead was in command of the Pembina after, the, uh, after being on the monitor. And he kept his ship always ready to run down a blockade runner and actually captures two. So, you know, what can you say?